So these are the last words I'm going to record for this class, talking about extinction and what we can do about it. We all know that extinction is a natural process, but its present rate is not. And it's of concern because we can lose evolutionary lineages and their genetic diversity forever. The relatively low rate of natural extinction that's always existed is called background extinction. In the fossil record, we can see that the lifespan of most species is from is 1 to 10 million years. And by looking at the fossil record, we can figure a background extinction rate of one species per year. So another kind of natural extinction is mass extinction, such as that caused by a meteoric impact with that we know happened at the end of the Paleozoic and Mesozoic eras, causing extinctions of big groups of organisms. But what's really been happening a lot in the last 500 or more years are anthropogenic extinctions. These are ones caused by humans. And they are what make the modern extinction rate far in excess of natural levels of extinction. If we look at this demographically, any time deaths exceed births for a long period of time, that can lead to extinction in a process called demographic stochasticity. So demographic stochasticity has led to the extinction of different species for different reasons. And in the U.S., the principal causes for population declines for endangered species are in, can fall into four categories. The first is that their habitats have been reduced and modified. This is the majority of cases. Sometimes the populations get so small they can't effectively reproduce. Sometimes new species have been introduced to the U.S. that have caused the demolition of a native species. And lastly, some species have been overexploited to extinction. So let's look at each of these reasons in turn. When habitats are reduced and fragmented, this causes species present to go extinct. And <clears throat> some habitats have been totally transformed by humans. For example, most of the native prairie in the United States was turned into farmland. So all of the native prairie plants and butterflies and animals had nowhere to live. Fragmentation of habitat creates additional problems for species native there. In the small areas that remain, maybe not enough individuals are supported to continue the species, especially for larger animals, predators, etc. And small populations can randomly go extinct, if, especially if a catastrophe befalls them. Fragmentation increases the edge habitat, which is lower quality habitat. And the species that exist in fragmented habitats can perhaps not move, especially with changing climate induced by global warming um, exacerbating their problems. Small population size negatively affects most persisting populations. Not only is stochastic extinction a risk, but reduced genetic variation can increase the probability of extinction. There are recessive um, lethals or detrimental alleles that are expressed more, more abundantly. Founder effects may cause only a few alleles of any particular gene to be available in breeding and, and genetic drift can cause little populations to become more and more um, inbred. All of these things pose problems for healthy populations persisting. Sometimes habitat quality for native species is diminished with 
introduce predators, competitors, and diseases. And island habitats are especially vulnerable to introduced species, and we've seen lots of cases of extinction in Hawaii and in Australia. Aquatic systems are also vulnerable, and in fact, continental areas are not immune to the negative effects of exotic species. It's shameful, really, how many species were driven to extinction by overhunting and use. It's remarkable to me that the arrival of humans in North America was accompanied by the rapid extinction of 56 species in 27 genera of large mammals. Other anthropogenic reasons for extinction include introducing toxins into the food chain, like with the overuse of DDT to control pests on crops. All of the other wildlife was affected, insects and birds, and top predators suffered as these toxins accumulated in their systems and made them unable to reproduce, like the California condors, whose eggs collapsed. Disease introduced organisms can lead to the elimination of native species, and sometimes diseases can switch their hosts when the ecological situation changes. So we've seen this with even with diseases moving from wildlife to humans. Some ecologists have asked why are some species more vulnerable to extinction than others. In some cases, they're very attractive or delicious, and they may have evolved in the absence of predation or hunting, so they're not careful or wary at all. They may have evolved in the absence of disease organisms, or they may have a limited distribution, geographic range, and small local population sizes, all making them more vulnerable to extinction. So conservation planning has to take into account the ecological requirements of the species, but also the amount of space and resources needed to support a minimum viable population, abbreviated MVP. This is the smallest population that can sustain itself in the face of environmental variation. And these MVPs have to be large enough to remain out of danger from stochastic extinction. So is it more important to focus on conserving charismatic species or their habitats? Many conservation efforts have been focused on particular species. But what are the pros and cons of this versus a habitat or ecosystem approach to conservation? The conservation international approach has been to identify biodiversity hotspots around the world. These are places with large species diversity, unique endemic species, but also that are in, in, under a lot of developmental pressure from humans. So let's summarize. A biodiversity hotspot is an area that's critical for conservation. They have high species diversity and endemism. Some or all of their biotas are unique. And these are places that are under pressure for development. It might be relatively easy to set aside parks on paper, and in fact, some of these hotspots may have national parks or some sort of preserve system, but many conflicts remain with peoples living there who need to make a living and survive. So maybe it's the developed world must bear the costs of conservation in the, de in the developing world by sending aid and subsidies to people in those regions. So what we've learned in the field of island biogeography can advise the design of nature preserves. We know that from the species area relationship that bigger areas hold more species. We know that edges are usually degraded habitats, so the less edge is better. And also that patches of habitat have to be close enough so organisms can move between them. 
So general recommendations for conservation are that larger reserves are better than smaller reserves. Maybe one large area is better than several smaller that add to the same size because of the edge effects on the smaller ones. Also, we know that corridors connecting isolated areas are very desirable. Circular areas are better than elongated areas with more edge. But some people disagree, and this has led to what's called the SLOSS controversy. SLOSS means single large or several small. This is because some ecologists argue that several small areas in different habitats in a region may be more effective than one large area in uniform habitat in conserving greater amounts of biodiversity. Also, some people talk about it's good not to put all your eggs in one basket because one small site may be hit by some disaster where the other, others may not be. In any way, and at any rate, nature preserves should be designed with habitat requirements of the species in mind that inhabit those um, places. If species migrate, the diverse habitats need to be linked by corridors, like birds that migrate up and down mountains as fruits come into bloom, trees come into fruit, I should have said. And areas that are spanned by roads and pipelines, those um, things that interfere with migration should be bridged, maybe lifted above, up so wildlife can move under them. I want to talk about a couple of endangered species now that are iconic. One that has been rescued from the brink of extinction is the California condor. And it's a success story with some important lessons for future conservation efforts. In the 1980s, the California condor existed in a very small numbers, only 20 individuals. So the decision, a dramatic one, was made to bring them all into a captive breeding program. One of the reasons their numbers had dwindled so is they couldn't reproduce. The eggshells were so soft they would collapse and no babies could be produced due to um, accumulation of DDT and other toxins. So after living in captivity for a while, the populations had been amplified and they can now be released into habitat preserves that were purchased expressly for condor conservation. They may not be beautiful birds, but they're enormous and very majestic. The Tracks set aside for condor conservation are now there for the benefit of all the other organisms that live there. And the experience gained from this program can benefit future programs because these large tracts of natural habitat were preserved and the public's awareness of conservation efforts has been heightened. So condor populations are also compatible with other uses of the preserved lands, human recreation, hunting, etc., as long as appropriate precautions are taken to not totally disregard the balance of nature. There's a very different situation in the Pacific Northwest. The spotted owl, an endangered species and its conservation, were in, opposed strongly by the timber industry which had a vested interest in felling these old-growth forests. So there was a, a war raging between loggers who'd grown up and made their living this way for years and small sawmill owners, these guys versus the ecologists. And there were lots of... Um, red press, I guess. Who gives a hoot about the owls anyway? The birds were putting the lumberjacks out of work, and things got pretty nasty. There was a um, supposedly humorous but kind of negative stuff put out recipes of how to cook spotted owls and even spotted owl helper.
like hamburger helper. A similar thing has happened in the lower keys where key deer live. In fact, there's a place called the key deer barbecue with the same sort of sentiment. But that example from California with the condor showed that concessions to the condors was, were neither difficult nor expensive. And making those concessions simply depended on calling up values that acknowledge natural systems as an integral part of the environment of humankind. A local example that we have to deal with here is manatees. And even this little clip art here it seems to me shows propeller scars on their backs. There are some simple solutions to letting us live in harmony with these beautiful creatures. Around shorelines where manatees hang out, boats need to move slowly in no wake zones. People should leave them alone. I think there's too many places where people are encouraged to touch and hug manatees or feed them lettuce or fresh water. They can do well on their own. And you can support conservation efforts by buying license plates that give money to these efforts, like the manatee license plate. I should point out that as panthers, you all may enjoy having a panther license plate, too, to support panther conservation. <laughs>